you would take your Bible, open it up to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, and if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. The Bible says this, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which were seen were not made of the things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it uh, he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them which diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God, things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to save uh, to the saving of his house, uh, by the which he condemned the world, and because, or and became heir of, of the righteousness which is by faith. Let us pray. Master, I come before you. I want to thank you and praise you for how good you are. I want to thank you for your love and your kindness toward us. Father, I want to thank you that we have the ability to trust in you. I want to thank you that we have the ability to have saving faith and keeping faith. Lord, I thank you that you've allowed us uh, to know your Son and His sacrifice, and because of that, we're able to come to the throne room boldly. I pray now, Father, that you would get me out of the way, that you would hide me behind the cross, and I pray that your words would go out, Father. And I pray, Father, that you would encourage us in your faith, that you would grow us in trusting knowledge of you. Father, I pray that you do great and mighty things in the hearts of your people. And Father, if there be one here today lost, I ask you to save them before it's everlasting too late. And Father, we'll praise you and we'll thank you for what you do. You're a good God, we trust you now in Christ's name. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Faith is a common denominator. And by common denominator, I mean it throughout every facet of life. Faith uh, is common in everything, in every day life, uh, we express some form of faith. Uh, it may not be the biblical faith we're going to get to here in a minute, but we, uh, we do express faith in something. No one can live a single day without expressing faith, faith in this physical world. You, when you woke up this morning, most of us that paid our power bill had faith that when we flipped the light switch, the light was going to come on. Uh, most of us, when we went to our car and we turned the key over, we had faith uh, that that car was going to start. Uh, we have faith that when we put a letter in the mail or a package in the mail, that the postal service is going to deliver it to where we intended it to go. Sometimes I have less faith in that than other things, but we still have to have faith in that. When you go to the pharmacy, you have faith that the pharmacist is going to put the correct medicine in the bottle that you're going to take home and take. You have to have faith uh, in the surgeon or the doctor when you're going to have surgery. You have to have faith uh, in the plane when you get on to fly from this place to that place. You have to have some kind of faith. When you walked into this building this morning, you had faith in the architects that built this building. You may not have realized it, but you had faith. And it's based on maybe a past experience of you walked into this building before and it didn't fall down on you. 
Uh, but you have to have a faith uh, in those things, those faith based on past experiences, but also a faith of, of trusting what somebody else has told you or said. They've told you they're a good doctor, therefore you trust them to operate on you or operate on someone in your family. You've seen a plane take off before and land uh, later, and you believe that because uh, there are less plane crashes than car crashes that you're going to be safe flying in this plane because you've drove your car uh, 10, 15, 20,000 miles and hopefully done the right maintenance. If not, come see me. I'll take care of that for you. But the car is going to continue to do what it needs to do. You have faith in those things uh, without really realizing it. But those fa the faith in those things, just like faith in me, or as Brother Jason says all the time in Sunday school, if you trust in me, I'm going to eventually fail you. And that's true of me. If you trust in me to do something, I have a memory that's about that long. And if I don't write it down, if I don't keep it in front of me, I'm not going to remember. So I can fail you in that regard. That's why I have to take notes constantly. But, but also, say you buy a new car. You drive it off the lot, man, it's beautiful, it's shiny, it's perfect. You don't expect to ever have a problem with this car because it's a new car. But you know what the manufacturer puts on cars? They put warranties. You know why? Because there's the unknown. There's defects. There's flaws. There's problems. Things can happen. Now, with Honda, it's much less than other things. <laughs> no, I'm, maybe I'm a little biased. I heard that. But, but seriously, there can be defects in anything you purchase. There can be problems. If you have a problem with a car, and say it's a major problem, say you buy a new car, you've had it for two weeks, and the transmission goes out. That's pretty serious. You have a problem having faith in that vehicle in the future. Even if you take the vehicle to the repair shop, they put a new transmission in. It's fixed, it's perfect, it's just like it was new. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, I hope this thing don't break down again. And if it does break down again, then you begin to lose faith in the automobile service department that you took the vehicle to and the vehicle that you're driving. Because faith in those things... Uh, <clears throat> those things that are flawed, those things that are imperfect, can never, can never meet all of our expectations. That's why people trade cars so often. That's why people buy new things. That's why people change doctors. That's why if mistakes are made, if something happens, then, then people want to jump off the faith they had in this and they want to go to something else because... That's a, a earthly faith, a, a fleeting faith. But also people express faith in spiritual things. Uh, there's plenty of people in this world that, that, that are of different backgrounds, talents, uh, status, uh, that, that put faith not only in, the, in this physical world but in religious things such as, uh, you know, if you're... If you're Muslim, you put your faith in the Quran and Muhammad. Uh, if you're a humanist, you put your faith in yourself. If um, you know you're, and there's several religions that put their faith in their own works uh, and their own good. But none of those things are lasting faith. None of those things are a saving faith. None of those things are the faith that we need. And what we need is a biblical faith. Your faith is not worth anything more than the object you're putting it in. And if you put your faith in something that's flawed or false, that faith, as I mentioned before, will fail you. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God has preserved His Word generation after generation after generation, text found after text found after text found that all line up 
to make the canon of the Word of God that we have today. Biblical faith is the only constant. And the reason that I say biblical faith is because that's the faith that we have in our Savior. That's the faith that we have in our God. Because we have the canon of the Word of God, we are able to look and know how we can know the Savior of the universe, how we can know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Biblical faith is so important because it tells us things like Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Saving faith starts the faith in our, in our heart, in our life. Saving faith grows into a faith that, that, that is, is compelled to do action. A, a faith that causes us to walk with God. As we get into the passage today, I'm going to look at two main points. I want to explain briefly a little bit about what faith is. And then secondly, I'm going to talk briefly about what faith does. There's no way I could cover every topic of faith today. But to understand what faith is, I guess one of the biggest things we have to do first is get some misconceptions about faith out of the way. And the first misconception I see, and it's it's popular across our nation, is, is that by having faith, We can manipulate God. That is false. That's not true. Just because you name something doesn't mean God's going to give it to you. Just because you believe something doesn't mean it's going to materialize in your hand. Just because you have, quote unquote, a sincere faith to believe in something doesn't mean that it's biblical faith. We cannot manipulate God with our faith. Our, we have our faith because of our hope in God. And I'll get into that in a minute, but, but having faith, believing that it's going to give you a life, a life of ease and blessing is not the faith that the Bible teaches. The second misconception is, is that, blind, that faith is a blind leap into darkness. Faith is not a blind leap into anything. Faith is not blind. Some people believe the saying you just have to, or they believe that the saying you just have to have faith is the same as saying, I I just have to act contrary to everything I know and everything I trust in, uh, and it'll work out for the for the best. But faith is not blind. Faith is 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 led by the hand of God. When me and my family left Alabama years ago and moved to Wyoming on faith, believing God was sending us out there to start a church. I did not do that blindly. I did that under the direction of God, and God directed every step forward. Now, I could not see what the fruit of that labor was going to be. I couldn't see the end result of what was to come. I couldn't see what was going to happen when we drove 1,500 miles across country and, and, and moved to a different location, I couldn't see what was ahead. But that did not change the fact that I did not step forward on blind faith. I stepped forward on directed faith by the hope of my Savior and the God who was leading me forward. Faith is not blind. Faith, uh, f- faith may be in the hope of things not yet seen, but it is not blind. Thirdly, Faith is, uh, <clears throat> the third misconception is faith, uh, faith is a simple, uh, sincere devotion to whatever God you happen to follow, and that is false. Uh, I, you may have heard the saying, well, he's a person of deep faith. Just because you're a person of deep faith, as I said before, it matters the object of your faith. The object of your faith. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. It does not matter that you have True faith. In Hebrews 11, uh, one of the only words I've seen fully defined in the Bible, I mean, it lays it out. Faith is, here you go. Faith is this right here. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. 
For by it the elders obtained good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. True faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstance or consequence. Faith is described in twofold way. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The first word translated there, substance in the Greek, literally means to stand under or support. Faith is a foundation. Faith is a foundation. It is the foundation of your Christian walk. If you do not have your foundation in the biblical truth of God's Word, the biblical faith in God's Word, then your foundation is flawed. There was a missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. And when, when he first went to China, he was in a ship. And the ship got very close to uh, an island of, that was known for cannibalism. Uh, and the, 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 there was no wind, it was very calm seas, and they were slowly drifting toward the shore. And the savages there on the island were eagle, eagerly anticipating the feast that was to come. And the captain came to Mr. Taylor, and he sought him to pray for God to help. And Mr. Taylor said, I will, provided that you set your sails to catch the breeze. The captain declined. He said, I'm not letting down the sails in the dead calm, but let me see the wind. Let me see the wind and I'll let down the sails. Mr. Taylor said, I will not undertake to pray for a vessel unless you prepare the sails. Finally, the captain, out of desperation, opened the sails. Mr. Taylor went to pray. And not long after he'd been praying, there was a knock on his door of his stateroom. And he heard the captain's voice say, Are you still praying for wind? Which he replied, yes. And the captain says, well, you better stop praying for it. We have more wind than we can manage. Faith is preparing your life for what God's going to do. Faith is preparing on what you've seen God do in your life. If you trust Him to save you for all eternity, then you can have faith for whatever's to come ahead. No matter the trial, and I would say floating toward an island of cannibals is a pretty big trial. No matter the trial, no matter the tribulation, no matter the situation, no matter what's come at you, faith is important. And it's important to be prepared to receive whatever God has for you. You get that concept? They needed to be away from the island. The man of God said we needed wind. I'll go pray for it, but let's support our prayers. Let's support it. Church I was at many years ago, I was probably 20 years old, maybe 19, 19, 20 years old. We were praying for God to work and move in the church, to grow the church. Pastor had been there for about 16 years, and he come to everyone and he said, "What we're going to do is we're going to canvass the community. We're going to go and we're, we're, we're not going to browbeat anybody. But we're going to go house by house, door by door, and just invite people to come to church. And we're going to pray. We're going to have a, a, a week-long revival type meeting, and we're going to pray that God blesses. And so we went out and we canvassed the community. We talked to people, we invited people to church, we handed out flyers, very simple, and we prayed. We met up at the church and we prayed that God would work and God would move. When we got to church, 
the morning that we were starting the services. And some young men of the church decided that we were going to set out extra chairs. Because we were going to trust that God was going to do something great in our church. That He was going to grow it. That He was going to do what He had promised to do. What He had led our pastor and vision to do. So we put extra chairs out. That first service came. We had maybe two or three visitors. Nothing big. Next service happened. We put out the extra chairs again. Maybe two or three more visitors. All through the week, we didn't really see those chairs get used much. And we could give up hope and faith. But I want to tell you what we did see. We were looking... And our mind says, God, do something temporary that we can see, that we can see the fruits of right now. And God said, you have no clue what I've got in store for you. We watched a church of between 55, 70 people grow to a church of about 140 people over about a six-month period. And you say, well, what's that got to do with the chairs getting put out? Because we trusted God and we believed Him and we prepared the church to receive more people than our pews would hold at the time. God worked and blessed and He did above and beyond all we could ever imagine. He didn't send visitors to our church. He sent church members to our church. Amen. He grew the church because we were faithful in believing and trusting that He was going to. Right. Do you understand what the difference in faith in what you see and faith in what you hope to accomplish or what you, the hope that you have in Him? We hope to see God do great things. And we're trusting and believing and we're setting out to prove and, and, and to, to support those prayers. The simple setting out of those chairs may not have meant much to, to anyone there, but it meant a lot to those people that were there six months from then, those people that were there for a year from then, when they saw the church nearly double in size because God worked and God moved under the leadership of that pastor to do great things. I want you to know something today, church. Hey, there, there is... There is, there is Faith that we can experience in our everyday life. Things that we can see God do in our everyday life if we would be willing to support our prayers. Secondly, the word faith was described as evidence. And that means facts, uh, internal conviction of truth, an inward conviction that allows us to believe things that are not yet seen. God performed, God performs what He has promised. And as I give you my simple little story, I'll tell you one that's, that I read about George Mueller. George Mueller was traveling by ship, and the captain of this ship, and this is the captain that tells this story, he said, I've been on the bridge for 24 hours. I had been up there, uh, and I had never left it. And Mueller come to me, and he said, uh, I've got to be in Quebec Saturday afternoon. And as the captain of the ship, I'd been on the ship for many, many years, many, many, many times I had sailed the seas. And I looked at him, and I said, what you're asking is impossible. And Mueller, came, uh, Mueller said to me, Very well, if your ship cannot take me, God will find some other way. And then he told the captain, I have never broken engagement in 57 years. Let us go down into the chart room and pray. 
Captain said, I looked at the man of God and thought to myself, what lunatic asylum has this man escaped from? For I have never heard such a thing as this. Mr. Mueller, I said, do you not see how dense this fog is? And he replied, my eyes are not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. And he knelt down and prayed one of the simplest prayers. And when he had finished, I was going to pray. But he put his hand on my shoulder and told me, you don't need to pray. As you do, as you do not believe God will answer, and as I believe he already has, there is no need whatsoever for you to pray about it. <laughs> and I looked at him, and George Mueller said, Captain, I have known the Lord for 57 years. And there has never been a single day when I have failed to get an audience with my king. Get up. And the captain open the doors and you will find that the fog is gone. I got up and the fog indeed was gone. And on that Saturday afternoon, George Mueller kept his promised engagement in Quebec. My friends, that is conviction that only faith, that only faith can bring that is, that is truly having faith in God to make such a statement and not be convinced that you're setting yourself up for failure. Mm. To be so convinced, but this man bowed down knowing it was God's will for him to be in a certain place at a certain time and he simply asked God to do what he knew that he could do. Knowing that God's will, or knowing God's will and knowing God's power allowed them to see God do great things. That kind of faith can still exist. But we are weak. And we don't trust fully in the promises of God. We are not convicted or convinced in our heart that God will carry out His plan. And I think that's where we fall short. Just as sin convicts you, and you know you must repent, when following God's will and His plan for your life, sin's conviction or confidence that you know He will make a way for whatever He has set out for you to accomplish. So what is faith? Faith is supporting God's will in your life by making preparation to see it through and having conviction so strong that anything that gets in the way of God's will and God's, that you know that God's power will take care of it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is trusting in God with all your heart, leaning not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledging Him and letting Him direct your path. That's what faith is. So what does faith do? And I'll be brief as we're running out of time. Hebrews 4 says, By faith Abel offered to his God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that uh, he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. We don't know the details of, of, of Abel's faith in completion. We don't know how much had been revealed to Abel about how to worship God, but, it, but we do know his father, Adam, walked with God. And we do know uh, that his face caused him to worship God. This verse tells us that Abel's offering was a more excellent sacrifice. He chose the best lamb as the offering, uh, and he brought it to the place of sacrifice. The first thing we see here that faith is, is faith is saving. Even though Abel died at his brother's hands, what did God say? It said Abel's blood cried out to him. It references that relationship or the relation between, between faith uh, as it says there in that latter part of the verse. It says that he being dead yet speaketh. If you're saved here today, you have faith that God has saved you then when you walk away from this walk of life, no matter how you leave, whether it's in the rapture or in the grave, your blood will cry out to our God. And our God, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
And we will forever spend eternity with our Lord and Savior. Saving faith is of, of uh, up so, up so much importance. But secondly, we see that once faith has saved you, faith allows us to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God translated him. For before he was translated, he had the testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Enoch lived a, God, a life before God destroyed the earth because of man's evil. Yet Enoch managed to keep himself pure because Enoch walked with God. The Bible tells us for 65 years Enoch didn't walk with God. But on the birth of his son Methuselah, the Bible says, and this is in Genesis 5, verse 21 and 22, but his, his son, when his son Methuselah was born at the age of 65, it says after that point on that Enoch walked with God. That Enoch walked with God. So once he started walking with God and communing with God and, and being faithful to the Lord, he was constantly in the presence of God. The Bible says that Enoch lived a life and was taken without seeing death because he pleased God. You know, I, I want you to know today that faith not only saves, but us having faith pleases God. And thirdly, faith calls Noah to work. Faith will cause us to work, church. Noah built an ark. For 120 years, he built an ark over 100 miles from the nearest ocean. He had to be ridiculed. It was an evil world that he lived in. But he built the ark anyway. You know what? When you heard the sound of the tree getting cut, you know what that was? That was faith. When you heard the sound of the saw cutting the boards, you know what that was? That was faith. When you saw Noah putting the pitch to seal all the seams. You know what that was? That was faith. He was preparing his life and his family for what God was bringing in the future. And he was ready for it. You see, having faith will cause us, having faith will cause us to work for God. So what does faith do? It saves us, it pleases God, and it causes us to work. I don't think Abel could have worshipped God without faith. I know that Enoch could not have walked with God without faith. And I know that Noah would have never worked for God like he did without faith. Think of it like this. Or think of your life like this. Think of a young child in a pool. Pools, say it starts out on one end at four feet deep. And it goes up to six feet deep. Alright? You got the kid... And he's in the dad's arm, and the dad's kind of wading out in the pool. And as the dad starts getting deeper into the pool, the kid couldn't touch at any point, but as he starts getting deeper into the pool, the kid starts to get kind of scared, and holding on to tighter and closer to his dad because he's afraid uh, that he might drown. And without the father, he's exactly right. Without the father, he certainly would, but... If he would have been able to truly look at the whole situation, if he had been able to truly look and analyze what was going on, he would have realized there was no reason to panic. The water depth in any part of the pool was over his head. Had he not been held up, he would have drowned to begin with. His dad was his only safety anywhere in the pool. His safety depended on him. At various points in our life, all of us feel that we are getting out of our depth. Problems abound, loss of job, bad news from a doctor, loss of a loved one. Our temptation is to panic, for we feel we've lost control. Yet as the child in the pool's example, the truth is we've never been in control. God's been holding us up the whole time. Church, we have to realize that that's the faith that we need to understand. God's holding you. And whatever's coming at you, whatever's coming at our church, whatever's coming at your family, 
God's still in control. He's still holding you. And He's walking you through the deep end of the pool just as He'll take you to the shallow end later. Trust in Him. Have faith in Him. Hold to Him. And, and, and realize that, hey, God will walk you through that saving faith. He'll walk you through that pleasing faith. And He'll keep you through your working faith. That He'll do great things in you and in your, in your family's life. And in this church, if we'd simply trust and have faith in Him, as you bow your head and you close your eyes, as, you, as the musicians come to play a song of invitation, I want you just to ask yourself, have I lost faith? Has my faith been waning of late? Has it, has it depleted? Has it gone down or is it getting stronger? Am I trusting God more in the trial times than I was in the good times? Or do I find myself lacking? Whatever your need is today, God's the answer. He wants to work and move in your heart and life. All you have to do is realize that if you'll place your trust in Him, He is the God that will never leave you, never forsake you. He is the God that will never fail you. No matter how bad things get in this world, God is still in control. And one day, one day you will enter in to the glories of His kingdom by the saving faith of God. As you stand to your feet, I pray we begin a song of invitation. Would you do business with God?